Welcome to Good Game, I'm Hex. And I'm Bajo. This week is almost a wish list of some of our favourite things, Bajo. We've got space, zombies and lynxes, which are kind of like cats. Yes, and we'll see how those little guys survive the elements in Shelter 2. And what's worse than Hitler? Undead Hitler, of course, and Zombie Army Trilogy. <laughs> Plus, we check the inbox to answer some of your questions, but before that, here's a game. Can you name it? It's 1945. Hitler's army has been broken. It seems there is nothing he can do to win the war, except zombies. Good cut. This is not a good sign. Oh, chainsaw guy, chainsaw guy. Oh, God. Ah! Oh, we are in trouble now. This way, this way, this way. Oh, look at him do his little pirouettes. We can dance all night. <laughs> Zombie Army Trilogy is a four player cooperative shooter developed by Rebellion. The first two games were released as standalone expansions to the Sniper Elite series, with an alternate occult and zombie themed timeline. Whoa, jetpack zombie! Jetpack sniper zombies. As you do. Why do these zombies have jetpacks? Why don't we have jetpacks? The third unreleased game has been bundled with remasters of the original two for PC, PS4, and Xbox One. And it's zombie decimating fun, isn't it, Bajo? Yeah, absolutely. Carving up Zeds in this setting is thrilling. All three games follow the Left 4 Dead formula. You make your way through quite large maps. Oh, behind. With a few safe rooms thrown in to restock supplies. Oh, yes. Oh, safe room. Safe room. And take a break from the onslaught. Oh, this is more like it, you guys. I could settle down in here. Yeah. But quickly, you're back into the fray, and what a fray it is. OK, there's, there's some ones too close for me to get now. Oh, my. Guys down, but they're on us. Help. Watch your backs. Kicking. Bad, 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 bad. A little trap. Oh no, oh no. Ah! I'm getting swarmed. I'm bleeding out. Oh, it's all down to you, Hex. And it's ah. all over. Bajo, I blame you for faking us into that death trap. The pacing is fantastic, isn't it? This game loves to throw huge numbers of zombies at you, and it does its best to scare the crap out of you when you first see them coming. Oh man, there are so many amazing reveals of walkers in the mist. I don't think I've seen a game reveal zombies so dramatically and cinematically like this game does. Yeah, you are often shrouded in darkness, but that never becomes bothersome because it's just so interesting to see the hordes against these backdrops. The particle effects dramatically illuminate the oncoming waves and you can't help but fret a little. You'll also never have enough ammo on you, so in order to take them all out, you'll be scavenging mid-fight a lot. And I dare say no other game I've played places such an importance on headshots. Yeah, I agree. And that does make sense. It is a zombie game after all. You have to shoot for the head. Or kick it off. I love kicking zombies, Hex. Oh, and skellies. Oh, skeletons. That's cool. Just kick these guys. Yes, kicking skellies is officially the best. <laughs> But it's the locations that will really pull you through this game. Such as the many war-torn streets of Berlin, underground subways, and serve ammo. And the terrifying zombie production center. The ammo, man. And there's lots of little nice touches within the environments too. Such as soldiers on the ground who have obviously fought to the last moment. This forest is cool. Isn't it so pretty? Pretty is one word. Oh, look at this. Oh, that's there, are, awesome. there are hands coming out of the wood. Zombie trees. Guys, I have a, I have a really bad feeling about this particular area. I think it looks friendly. I'm going to stay in this cabin over <laughs> here. Was it the bodies on the pikes that, uh, that tipped you off? The skewered heads or the waterfalls of blood? This wasn't in the brochure. <laughs> and the curdling yeah. screams aren't helping either. <laughs> Look at this giant skull up there with red demonic guys, eyes. Guys, they're coming. Guys, they're coming. It's like the cover of a, a heavy metal album. <laughs> guys. You can tell the devs have put a lot of time into all those setups and reveals as well, so that none of the locations feel too similar. Yeah, there's a lot of love behind this. And it's a good thing too, because the weapons themselves don't feel that different. Yeah, they all feel too similar. Mm. I do like the old weaponry though. 
Billy Anfield is my personal favourite, and just like with Sniper Elite, you can often watch those slow motion X-ray shots. Although the game is so frantic, so it's not really worthwhile, and you tend to skip them or just turn them off. Yeah, but you just can't go past a shotgun for zombie slaying. You know what, Hex, normally I would be with you on that, but this time around I actually prefer the assault rifles. There's just something about spraying and carving through these particular slow-moving Nazi zombies that is uniquely satisfying. The impacts of your weaponry is rewarding, and the swarms come at just the right pace. And when there's four of you shooting and things are exploding everywhere, it becomes an orchestra of zombie guts. Whoa. The tougher zombies and the occult demon-y Nazis mix things up in the right way too. You'll often have to change tactics and think about how to use your grenades and tripwires effectively to get through a section. Should I put one by the door? No, I reckon you put them further back so we can slowly move backwards if we need to, uh, you know what I mean? You're such a strategy master. I see what you're doing. You've done this before. A little Stop Hansel and Gretel trail of bombs. <laughs> <laughs> There's also a wave mode, which we didn't spend as much time in, mainly because the campaign is just so much fun and there's so much content there to get through. It's great to have that wave mode option though. I mean, it's a popular mode for this kind of game. Yeah, absolutely. There is one major problem with this game though, and it's something so simple that it makes it a baffling oversight. We play this on Xbox One and you can't manually create a public lobby on any platform. This means if you are playing with randoms, you're just thrown into the mix without choice and you can't be a host. And with no region locking options, it meant that every single game I jumped into with randoms was almost unplayable because of lag. isn't it? To the point where if you don't have friends to play this, I would find it hard to recommend. Yeah, I agree. And it is more fun to play with friends with this kind of game, of course. There is the option to play solo, and you can change up the difficulty to make that work for you. But it's not really designed for that, and you'll probably rage quit a few times because of cheap deaths, which aren't a problem in multiplayer. It's worth mentioning that we did run into a few spawning and checkpoint bugs that wouldn't let us progress, and that forced us to restart a few checkpoints. Well, except for that lobby issue, and you know, the lag might not be so much of a problem on other platforms, it's hard to fault this game for what it sets out to do. It's a satisfying, challenging zombie slaying experience in beautifully designed maps. Plus, such great music, Bajo. So good. And most of all, Hex, I loved those curdling zombie screams. It's three and a half stars for me. I'm giving it three stars. There's brains and stuff happening in here. Oh, look at that. Check this spaghetti. Oh, it's moving! <laughs> <laughs> Here's what's making headlines. Nintendo has announced that it will be partnering with Japanese mobile developer DNA to bring its franchises to mobile devices. The two companies will both develop original games created specifically for mobile, and all of their IP will be eligible. As part of the announcement, Nintendo also confirmed development on their next console, the Nintendo NX, but provided no details except to say they'll give more details next year. Sony has announced that they will shut down their PlayStation Mobile service later this year. The service was originally designed to help indie developers publish games on Vita and mobile, but from July 15th, Sony will cease delivering content using this service. Then, from September 10th, there will be no way for users to download previous purchases. And that's all for this week. Thanks, Goose. Last year, we reviewed the sci-fi spin-off to Sid Meier's Civilization series, Beyond Earth. Well, now that universe has expanded with the turn-based tactics of Sid Meier's starships. We built the city. No, starships, not starship. We built the city oh, on rock and roll. We built this city. Nice drum solo. Thanks. What shall we find as we set our course beyond the stars? Nice shot. 
Starships was developed by a small team at Firaxis under the direct guidance of Sid Meier. In fact, he's even listed as one of the programmers. And it does feel like a bit of a pet project. You begin the game on a home planet with two ships at your command. From here, you move to nearby systems to complete missions and gain influence. As more planets join your federation, your borders expand until you control 51% of the galaxy's population and win the game. And who doesn't want to conquer the galaxy? Andromeda. 55 has joined our federation. The missions you do at each planet are mostly small combat encounters. These hex-based maps usually have a central planet circled by asteroids. The asteroids working as cover for your ships, blocking both passage and weapons targeting. Turns are fairly simple with the option to move within a limited range and take some shots at the enemy. But there's a layer of small tactical considerations too. Yeah, ships are better shielded at the front. So you'll do more damage if you hit from behind. You can go stealth with a cloaking system to stay hidden on the enemy's turn. And there are torpedoes you can fire that travel in a straight line from turn to turn until you choose to manually detonate them. Which can help flush enemies out of cover because no one wants to be a sitting duck. Hmm. There are also a limited number of single use battle cards that you can play each encounter. Battle card activated. These give you perks such as extra movement in a turn, double weapon damage, instant repairs, and so on. Repairs completed. Very handy in a pinch. On top of all this, each ship can have its various systems upgraded. Before each mission, you can spend credits on everything from the power of your shields, engines, weapons, and more. But you'll need resources to make all these improvements, and that means getting more planets under your belt. It's a tussle. Yeah, it's a hard slog. Winning a battle may only get you a small chunk of influence over a planet, so you have to work hard to expand your borders. I like that before you enter a mission, you can get your crew to assess the enemy fleet and calculate your chance of success. Chance of mission success, 46. Percent. Never tell me the odds, Hex. I often just jump in and give it a shot anyway, because quite often you can pull off an unlikely victory. Good work. Missions aren't all straight up deathmatch, though, they do vary. You may need to escort a ship to safety, destroy an enemy super weapon, or very occasionally simply find your way out of an asteroid maze within a time limit, pinging your sensors to get a glimpse of the right way to go. I like that they've tried to mix it up a bit, but I found those asteroid mazes more frustrating than anything else. Mm, I mean, I thought they were an okay change of pace. What really bothered me is that you can't rename your ships. I mean, let me personalise my little spacefaring squadron. Yeah, that's a shame. Yeah, it's just that that stuff really makes a difference to my overall experience. Even your choice of leader and faction at the beginning of the game are just a set of starting perks. So it makes it all feel very methodical. I was a bit sad there's no alien races, like with Beyond Earth. It's just a bunch of grumpy humans everywhere. That's spot on. And the diplomacy is pretty disappointing too. You never really feel like you're conversing with other leaders, just clicking through the stats on their progress. There is a delightful anxiety in watching the other federations gain territory though. Seeing those coloured borders expand and chew away at the influence you hold on planets is a real stress. I worked hard for that system, go away. The more you tighten your grip hex, the more star systems will slip through your fingers. Mm. I never really got into the larger strategy layer of this game. You can build cities and improvements on planets to increase the resources they output, as well as spend money on tech research, which mostly benefits your fleet. But I just found myself wanting better presentation for this information. That star map starts to look so cluttered, and digging through a spaceopedia to get an understanding of something is a bit of a chore. Yeah, the whole game is very roughly presented. We both played it on PC and it does feel a bit low budget, or at least very hurriedly developed. Yeah, it does. The only tutorial you get is a static splash screen at the start, which is a very poor start. And there's a distinct lack of options, no resolution settings, and that means the text is a little hard to see. Yeah, you can tell this has been designed primarily for a tablet audience and then ported to PC. There isn't even any multiplayer, which is usually the bread and butter for these kinds of games. It does feel a bit like this whole idea was originally meant to have been integrated into Beyond Earth somehow. Cannons have been damaged! But it was cut, and now it's resurfaced as this. You know, those short tactical battles can feel quite satisfying, but overall I just found this a little bit too lightweight. But at least they have kept it pretty cheap at under $20. I'm gonna give it two stars. I feel like we've been pretty harsh on this game, but I also think that's because we're playing it on PC and it really is designed for a tablet. I'm giving it two and a half. Well, today's question was sent in by Joshua from Melbourne. I think this time I have a genuine question. 
I have only recently heard that Nintendo gave in, their words, and are finally considering Mario and Zelda and a variety of other games for smartphones and iPhones, and was wondering why companies don't do this in the first place. Wouldn't they make more money to begin with if other companies did it in the first place? E.g. Bioshock make a complete collection and bring it out for PS4, Relic make a Mac version of Homeworld? Is it really that complicated to make a game for all slash various platforms? Well, Joshua, obviously we can't speak from experience on how complicated it might be to make a game for one platform, let alone all platforms. Yeah, but based on comments that we've heard from a lot of developers, it actually isn't that simple to bring games out on multiple platforms. Each platform has its own quirks and issues that need to be sorted out, so it's not as simple as simply flicking a switch. Yes, not only does each version take time and money to make, they also have to support it with patches and customer service after they make it. So publishers and developers have have to make tough calls on where they want to spend their limited resources. Mm. We know a lot of indie developers in particular struggle with developing for multiple platforms because for a small team, bringing a game out on everything is almost impossible. But in the case of Nintendo, I think for a long time they very strongly believed that their software is what drives their hardware sales. If they start making games for all platforms, then why would people bother buying a Nintendo console? Mm. That's a fair point. And from the sounds of it, Nintendo aren't going to be porting their major console games over to mobile. They'll just be making new games specifically for mobile based on their franchises. So I suspect the reason why they've decided to do it now, finally, is that they can see there's just so much potential in getting their franchises on the billions of mobiles out there. Plus, Nintendo are probably hoping that some of these new mobile players will consider buying their consoles to get the more meaty AAA experiences. Well, on that note, it's your review time. Oh, we haven't done one of these yet this year. Uh, how about we see what everyone thought of The Order 1886? Sounds good to me, Hex, and oh, it's gathered quite a range of scores from you all. LAC underscore 83 summed it up saying simply, looks great, plays not so great. Two and a half stars. But Dark Abyss here was clearly a fan saying, I love this game. In my opinion, those scores didn't justify the game. You can tell they did an excellent job and put in a lot of effort. Four stars. I know. Back down at the bottom of the spectrum though, Null wrote, The letterbox thing is frustrating as hell. Nowhere near enough gameplay and way too many quick time events. Big claim, lame game indeed. Two stars. Guilty. 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 I hear you there, Null. Filthy letterboxes. I do not like them, Hex. I spit on them. <laughs> Don't spit on me. <laughs> My Weddle clearly had a similar experience, saying, Frustrating stealth and boring combat ruin what should have been an epic adventure. Two and a half stars. Well, Ace gave a glowing review, writing, Loved this game. The story just kept on pulling me back to play just a bit more until I finished it. Five stars. And finally, Kay here also enjoyed it so much they couldn't control their fingers, writing, As defefisa. Rantings of a fanatic. Four stars. Mmm, insightful. Well, if you have any questions that you would like to ask us, you can do so via this web address. <laughs> On the internet. As far as concepts for video games go, very few were ridiculously absurd and far-fetched as the Sega classic Michael Jackson's Moonwalker. Even fewer, though, turned out to be great games with killer soundtracks like this one. Hit it! The game was based on the 1988 film of the same name, which was less of a movie and more of a surreal mashup of music videos, all strung together with a loose plot of kids getting kidnapped by the evil Mr. Big. Nothing could prepare you for his movie. The flick turned out to be a commercial success and spawned three different versions of the game. Firstly, a rubbish home PC top-down Maze Runner that looked and sounded nothing like the film, followed by two games developed by Sega, a scrolling beat-em-up for the arcades and of course the home console version, which is what I played. And while it's easy to look back and laugh at the absurdity of the game now, I remember even back then it felt like a weird idea for a game. Michael. I mean, how do you string together this convoluted movie into a playable game? And more importantly, how do you transform the King of Pop himself into one of the smoothest video game characters of all time? Well, this is how. First of all, you make your boot-up screen sound like this. Then you take the coolest scene from the film and make it your first level. Yeah! 
It also helps if the soundtrack is made up of 16-bit versions of some of the greatest pop hits ever, like Bad, Billie Jean, and of course, Smooth Criminal. Then you give your character magical dance moves to defeat enemies with. Remember to make every other move in the game look and feel just as funky. Don't forget to turn boss fights into classic choreographed dance routines. And that's pretty much it. Oh, and sometimes turn into a giant robot that can fire lasers! I mean, the level of awesome in this game was almost immeasurable. That's not to say it was perfect. Some of the game was actually kind of bad. Who's bad? You're bad. There was a hideously steep difficulty curve that jumped up in the third stage, so only rarely did my friends and I actually make it through to the final level, in which MJ transforms into a rocket car and chases down Joe Pesci through space. Honestly, not the weirdest thing you'd seen after playing through the entire game. Sure, other Mega Drive games out there might have had better stories, more action or varied gameplay, but it was near impossible to see Moonwalker lying there on the pile and not booted up whenever friends came around, even if it was just to hear those sweet electronic tunes or pull off one of the greatest dance moves and video game moves combined, the Moonwalk. Thanks, Goose. Shelter was a game that saw us experiencing the harsh realities of Mother Nature's cruel world, as we took on the role of a mother badger trying to defend and feed her cubs in the wild. Yes, for baby badgers, all manner of dangers lay waiting in the wilderness. Creatures in the dark, predators in the air, not to mention starvation and exposure. It was a surprisingly emotional and painful journey, wasn't it? Yeah, it really was, which is why I was both excited and apprehensive at the news of a sequel. In Shelter 2, you play a mother lynx. Well, my heart was a mess from the get-go because check this cuteness. <laughs> and if that doesn't get the hooks of emotional attachment in deep enough, this time you actually get to name them all. Ah, I know. I actually named all of my kittens after us. One called Hex, Bajo, Goose and Hingers. As your kittens are hungrily mewing in your den, your first task is to venture out and hunt down some food and bring it back to them. This will give them the strength to leave the safety of the den and follow you out into the wild. Shelter 2 is different in many ways, mostly because unlike our little friend the badger, the lynx is pretty high up in the food chain, so predators aren't much of an issue. Threats to the lives of your little kittens are almost non-existent. You're virtually free to chase and catch rabbits to your heart's content to make your kittens strong. Yeah, I was a little bit disappointed by that. Without the threat of predators, your main focus is on finding food. And that got a little monotonous and just felt unchallenging. It seems like they tried to fill this gap with other collectible elements within the game, but it's a far less engaging experience. Yeah, the game goes to all this effort to set up an emotional connection between you and your kittens, but they're rarely ever in danger. Well, as similar to the first game, you do need to keep them all equally well fed, which can be hard to do. Your prey consists mainly of rabbits, and they're quick. Mother Lynx tires easily with an energy meter that can only be filled by consuming food herself. So it's a balancing act of trying to keep all of your kittens equally well fed as well as yourself as the seasons change. And you know, that's not easy. What are you saying, Hex? Well, I just got a bit caught up chasing rabbits, you know, for food. And I thought I made sure I had everyone, just the little babies are so slow to catch up. But before I knew it, I turned around and one, two, Three. <gasps> Where's Bajo? I can't believe you let me die of starvation. I'm so sorry. I went back to look for you. I caught a rabbit and I was searching for ages, but the trees all look the same in the snow. Oh, I feel so bad. <laughs> 
You're a bad mother. You should feel bad. You know, apparently this is a legitimate thing, though, for big cats like cheetahs and stuff who have to run so far and so fast to catch prey for their young. Apparently sometimes they go so far that they lose their babies because they can't find their way back. Oh, just another harsh lesson of nature taught to us by shelter, I suppose. <laughs> Pressing on. The seasons turn and the landscape unfolds as you and your young continue the fight for survival. This sequel takes more of an open world approach to the landscape, rather than setting out specific environmental areas and challenges for you to get through. And again, I found this a little dull. Yeah, I found myself remembering that bushfire sequence from the first game and the river rapids. There were just so many wonderful moments of hardship. Here I spent most of my time just pretty lost. The map is really difficult to navigate and apart from the changing seasons there's not a whole lot of variety to the areas you'll encounter. This time around I found the screen a bit busy and a bit messy and perhaps it's because it's more open now, more open world, but I still think the art style is quite beautiful. I love the art style in this game and the way they've incorporated it into the seasonal changes is so lovely. I also really liked the rune-like designs of the landmarks and the celestial constellations. They all just harken back to something ancient and magical. After seasons of hunting and foraging, your kittens will grow into full-size lynxes themselves and get the chance to take on bigger prey. That was a cool moment, wasn't it? Setting out with your fully grown pack and hunting together. Yeah, they can keep up with you now and you feel a swell of pride. Hunting for deer is a little more exciting, but they're tougher to find. So to stave off hunger, you'll still be mainly relying on rabbits. The bulk of this game is rabbit hunting, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> the coming of age of your offspring is bittersweet, however, because as adults, a life of solitude calls them away and Mother Lynx is left to hunt alone once more. We won't spoil the ending, but overall, I will say that this sequel lacked the challenge, thrill and impact of the first, which is a real shame. Yeah, you can go back and start the game all over again. Expanding your family tree by playing as one of your now adult offspring. Except for poor baby Bajo, of course. May he rest in peace. But sadly, there isn't really enough to warrant a second playthrough. Well, unless you're feeling an enormous amount of guilt, maybe, for letting one of your children die and perhaps you want to atone for that. Yeah, all right, you've made your point. But sadly, I agree. For me, I think its biggest fault is just that open world approach and the lack of any environmental challenge. It really took something away from the game. What are you giving it? Well, this is still a wondrous experience and an interesting take on the circle of life. I did like the first game better, though. I'm giving this two out of five stars. It's two from me as well. Just answer the question, Bajo Pants. Who are you selling our secrets to? When are you going to start asking the right question? What question? What did you offer her? Just stop talking in riddles and get to the point. <laughs> you still don't get it, Goose. We've both been played, both of us, right from the start. I was never selling secrets. I was the distraction while you cleared her file. And she got away with it. No, that, that's not what happened. Really? <laughs> then where is she now? <laughs> Stephanie Ben Dixon, AKA Hex, elite computer hacker. That doesn't seem to be a government agency you haven't hacked into. Do you even know what any of this stuff actually does. I need an address! No, he's so in a way! keep tracking him. The address, damn it! I've got you now. It was a game, Goose! Right from the very start! Why couldn't you guess it, Goose? <laughs> Why couldn't you guess the game? <laughs> Why couldn't you guess the game for this week? <laughs> It was Hellcat Ace from 1982. A basic flight combat sim, it was your mission to shoot down the enemy's army of fighters and bombers. You had to monitor your fuel and ammunition supply as well as keep an eye on your tail for approaching aircraft. And it's our name the game because it was created by Sid Meier, the man behind this week's Starships. Fun fact, the reason why he made Hellcat was to impress Bill Steely and together they created Microprose software. Next week on the show, corruption leads all the way to the top with Battlefield Hardline. You scared yet? And it's from the creator of Dark Souls, so you know we're in for a rough ride. It's Bloodborne. Do you want to see how excited I am for Bloodborne? I'm going to do it in my face, ready? Okay. <gasps> I feel like that's your face for so many things and not all of them are excitement. <laughs> And over on Spawn Point on ABC3 this weekend, our show for younger gamers, we get swept up in the beauty and heartache of Ori and the Blind Forest. You may have noticed that Hingers has taken a break from our daily show Pocket. He will return, but in the meantime, Nick Richardson, friend of the show, is filling in. Yes, and you can check that out on iView and YouTube as well. Until next time, may all your games be good ones. Hex out. Bajo out. 
Oh my gosh, can we talk about Ori for a second? Yes. Apart from the fact that I was like in tears, like five what? seconds in, I cannot put it down. It reminds me a lot of um, when I first played the Lion King game. You know, just oh, the animation yeah. and the beauty of it, and also how sad I felt instantly. <laughs> I started playing, I'm like, yeah. Oh, great, it's beautiful. Yeah, <laughs> beautiful balance of challenge.